As I look back on the road I've traveled See so many times you carry me through If there's one thing that I've learned in this life My Redeemer is faithful and true My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said He will do Every morning His mercy is anew My Redeemer is faithful and true My heart rejoices when I read the promise There is a place I am preparing for you I know someday I'll see my Lord face to face Cause my Redeemer is faithful and true My Redeemer is faithful and true Everything He has said He will do Every morning Mercies are new. My Redeemer is faithful and true. Yet in every situation, He has proved His love to me. When I lack the understanding, He gives more grace to me. Faithful and true Everything He has said He will do Every morning His mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true My Redeemer is faithful Faithful and true. Father God, we thank you so much. That we, as we gather together in your name, your presence fills this place. Lord, not the building, but the lives of those who have come to trust you as a Lord and Savior. Lord, we have gathered here today, sinners in need of your grace and mercy anew today. Lord, we need another opportunity to trust you each and every day, sometimes moment by moment each day. And we thank you that you always offer those opportunities so that your life can be formed in us. Now speak clearly through your word and Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. If you pray with me, church, say amen this morning. I mess up on a daily basis. I wish I could tell you I mess up once a day, like a vitamin, but it's more than that. Usually it's several times before I get out the door. And the reason I do that is because I'm a sinner. I will die a sinner. I would like to tell you that one day I will be sinless, and I will, but that day I will be seeing Jesus face to face. Until then, it is our responsibility to sin less than what we used to. Only I have no power and authority to make that so. I can't because sin comes from inside us. We're defiled from the inside, not from the outside. 
And so everything I try to do is from the outside in. So if I'm going to sin less, it has to come from a power and authority from the inside of me working its way out. And that is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, as we believe it, we are made a new creation in Christ. We have the, now the opportunity to make use of that authority and power on a daily basis, what I will call second chances. I'm glad for second chances, aren't you? If you're married today, I know you love second chances. So, say, well, this is my first marriage. Right. And your spouse gives you second chances daily, do they not? Yes. I'm glad as a parent I get second chances with my kids because I biff it from time to time. I mean, I totally blow it from time to time with my kids. Don't you? Yeah. And as a pastor, I, I, I'll preach the word and then just during the week I'll just make horrendous mistakes. Horrendous. And what are we going to do with that? Well, think about this. Here's what we've been reading. We've been reading the story of the children of Israel under Joshua's leadership and God's leading conquer the promised land. It's called the conquest of the promised land. That the promised land is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the spiritual life that God wants us to live empowered by him. He wants us to take over the territory in this life that used to be under the control of the flesh and now live under the control of the Spirit of God. And Jericho represents, in this struggle, the first big obstacle, it represents the world. And boy, the world is big and it's awesome and it's just intimidating, isn't it? Just like the great walled city of Jericho. And think of what they did. There, for seven straight days, they marched around the, the city of Jericho in complete obedience and reliance upon God and what did God do he just destroyed that system he destroyed that system that city right before their eyes they didn't lift a finger to do it he did it for them and as it's a picture of God empowering us to defeat the forces of this world that we live in but in the midst of that victory ah we have to also deal with something else. Because the world is not our only enemy. And there's a lot of Christians, they've defeated the world. They don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't cuss anymore, they don't watch bad movies, they don't, they don't go to the casinos, they don't gamble, they don't do any of the vices. They've defeated the world system. But at the same time in defeating the world system, I've seen some Christians that would never think about gambling and they're filled with so much fear or filled with so much I've met some mean Christians before. You ever met any mean Christians? I mean, just mean as a snake. <laughs> Scary Christians. I met some Christians that were filled with all kind of jealousy and greed. And that, that's not the world. That's the flesh. And the flesh is represented by the city AI. It's small. See, the world is big, Jericho is big, but Ai, it's just this little city. And guess what? And as they were taking the world and defeating it, Achan, he got defeated by his flesh. And he took the stuff that didn't belong. He said, ah, God doesn't need that. I need that. Hey, God wasn't enough for him. Hey, that's what the flesh always tells you. God is not enough. That is at the core of everything sin problem that God is not enough I need more of something else isn't that the way the serpent approached Adam and Eve well did God really say that and he caused them to doubt and then as they gave him to, to, to doubt then the next thing they're denying that God said that and then the next thing they get deceived they get tricked right. <gasps> ate the fruit oh no and they get defeated in their flesh. Lust the, 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 the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. That's how Satan always approaches it. And it's the same thing you do with Achan. The same process. He took the stuff and what? Well, they got defeated at Ai. At little, after the great victory at Jericho, defeating the world, the flesh, though, 
I mean, sent them packing, sent them running, and they lost 36 men, lost their lives. So when we give into the flesh, it doesn't just affect us, it affects our loved ones, our family, it affects our culture, our society, our church, our communities. We don't sin in a vacuum. It splashes over to other people. You know, what do we do with that? Here, Israel, they defeated him. Well, they judged Achan and his family. Yeah, but they're still, there's Ai, and here we are, and now they're defeated. Well, they not they got no momentum now. I mean, it's like, oh boy, I mean, we defeated Jericho, and now look, we got, I mean, we're ashamed. This little town just defeated us again, and what? They had to bury those guys. And so there's a funeral parlor cast and pale over the whole nation. What are we going to do? And God shows up and he re-encourages them. He recommissions them because they needed new courage, did they not? Just like we do. See, that, the, the reason that so many people don't come to church, it's not just because of the cold and the slippery road conditions. I'll tell you why. It's because the flesh has done a number on them and they're like, I... I don't fit at that church anymore. I, I just, I, I got no victory and, and this has my life and they, and they just get disgusted at themselves. And they don't really believe scripture when it says that God's mercies are new each and every morning. And they're new each morning because we need them each morning. Wow. So new courage is needed in the life struggles. Especially after we mess up, we trip and we fall. Man, think about this. They were going to that town and they were expecting to hear, yeah, mighty victory, and they come home and they're carrying 36 dead men. That's that's a different thing than what you're expecting. This is what sin does. There's times where I sin and I see it coming, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to. You know, it's kind of like on a holiday when, you know, mom was cooking the food and you're, man, I can't wait to eat that. Sometimes it sins like that. You plan it ahead of time. It's premeditated. And you're like, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm just going to bathe in it. Well, that's not the sin of AI. The sin of AI is it catches us. Sometimes sin just catches us unawares. And we trip. We fall. We're like, man, I didn't see that one coming. Didn't see it coming. And it just, what? It tricks us. Before we know it, we're on the ground, we're bleeding, and we're, how did that happen? How did that happen? And that's very discouraging, especially when you're trying to do what's right. Can I get an amen to that? Oh, it just just crushes you in your spirit. And so God shows up and he talks to Joshua and the whole nation through Joshua in verse 1 and 2. Look what he says. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear. Look at this. And do not be dismayed. Don't think that anything's changed, Joshua. I mean, they were surprised at AI. Who wasn't surprised at AI? God wasn't. God knew AI was coming. He knew it. He knew Achan was going to take that stuff before Achan took it. God knows us. He knows our future today. He's not surprised. He says, don't be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. You notice when they were fighting Jericho, the world, the picture of the world, he said, don't take it. Don't take any of the gold, the silver. Don't take it. Don't need it. You don't need it. And that's a picture for us. We don't need anything that this world has to offer. But then when he goes to, when they go to fight AI, he says, you can take the plunder. Why? Because there's stuff in this life, stuff in our mind, our emotion, and our will that we need to take back from the enemy. And we need to plunder it for the sake of God. We need to pack, take back the treasures of our life and put it to use for him. So that's why he said when you're fighting the flesh, oh no, you're going to plunder it and you're going to put that stuff to use for you. For you. And so God shows up and re-encourages them and gives them a recommission. And then in the next few verses, 
he gives them the new tactical maneuver. So how are you going to do this? Because, you know, when we're defeated, when we, we fall on our face and we're still cleaning up the blood, the mess from our last problem, our last oops, our last trip up. That, by the way, don't you hate when you get tripped over the same thing over and over again? You're like, man, I thought I learned that. And, then, and it's like, got me again. I'm like, it's like Charlie Brown and the football. Come on. Stop falling for it, Tom. But I, okay. <laughs> Boom. There I go. So it's kind of hard to say, okay, God, I know you're, uh, yeah, let's, let, let's tackle it. He says, no, here's, here's, here's the tackle maneuvers. Here I, here's how I want you to go about it. Let's look in verse 3 all the way to 13. When Joshua and all the fighting men rose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us as before, we shall flee, run before them. Not run at them, run away from them. And they will come out after us. Until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say, oh, they're fleeing from us, just like they did before. So we will flee from before them. And then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire, and you shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. So Joshua sent them out. And they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent the night among his people. When Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai. So they're ambushed, laying in ambush on the west. He encamps on the north side of Ai with a ravine in between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 men, and then this is on another side, he took, takes 5,000 men and sets them in an ambush between Bethel, which is a sister, another small sister city, Bethel and Ai, to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city, and its rear guard west of the city, but Joshua spent the night in the valley. So the Lord gives them tactical maneuvers, he says, here's what I want you to do, and it, it it, it's kind of it, it's kind of interesting because he said set an ambush. It comes from the, the Hebrew word orib. It means a liar in wait. He said set an ambush for AI. And we know how the flesh works, do we not? Right. I know how my flesh works, and we are to set a trap for the flesh. We're to set a trap for our flesh in order to draw it out into the field of battle. That's what he was told to do. And then he takes 5,000 additional troops and he sets them between Ai and Bethel. And, and we don't know exactly because it, Joshua doesn't tell us, but they must have been working in unison with each other because later on in the passage it says that the men of Bethel ran out too and so they were ready for that. They must have known that they uh, were close enough as sister cities that uh, they would be involved in the struggle also. So he was ready for what? Uh, the other things that come to aid the flesh whenever we go to battle against it. But notice what the tactical maneuver is. Here's what it is. You're going to stand before the city, and then when they come out to fight you, you're going to run. Now that certainly doesn't sound like the Christian way, does it? No. Because you know what our flesh wants to do? It wants to wrestle with it. It wants to fight he wants to fight. Let me give you an example from my personal life. Last night when I was preaching this message, it popped into my mind while I was preaching because it was on my mind. Right before I came to church, I, talk, I was talking to my wife and she said, hey, after church we got to go to the grocery store and pick up some things. And I said, okay. And uh, so immediately when she said that, I don't know what she's thinking about, but I know what I'm thinking about. It's called Cheez-Its. That's what I'm thinking about. And she says, grocery store, Cheez-Its, okay? And that's just what happens. And uh, the flesh already starts, what? Starts doing a number on me. 
And here's what my flesh tells me. My flesh tells me, Tom, you can buy them, which I have the money, and you can handle it. You can eat just, and what do they say? Just a palm-sized portion. And that's all I eat at a time until the box is gone. But it just, she looks at me and I, palm. And then the palm's gone, and then another pile goes into the palm magically until the box is, it's gone. Now, that's what the flesh says. It tells us, it lies to us, and it says that's how to win spiritual victories, by wrestling with sin, by wrestling with the Cheez-Its. I have never won a spiritual battle wrestling with the Cheez-Its. You know when I win the battle? When I don't go down the aisle. So we came to the Cheez-Its aisle last night, and she went. And I, I pouted a little. I pouted, and I just kept walking. And I won the victory. Had no Cheez-Its last night. I missed it. I had kind of built up. But I starved the flesh. What did I do? I ran from it. I didn't wrestle with it. Because if I were to wrestle with it, get the box into that, and say, okay, here's what my flesh tells me. You can do it, man. Just open that cellophane because you're, you know, very carefully because you're going to use this box for weeks. For weeks. Just about, okay, there we go. It goes so fast. Well, just one more. Just another. And then about the fourth one, you're like, ah, who cares? I, I blew it. Right? Am I the only one that acts like that? It's over. I blew it. Then it's just, and I cranked the whole box open, and then it's right out of the box. Forget the palm thing. Why? Because that's what the flesh always wants us to do. Wrestle with sin. God says, no. I have wrestled with it for you. Hallelujah. Don't wrestle with it. Run from it. It is a picture of what we should do before our enemy, the flesh. Run from it. Why? Because the only way to defeat the flesh is by yielding in the process of it. We conquer the flesh by yielding. Now notice what it says. Look at verse 14, all the way to 29. Oh, this is good. Ready? And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, the one thing the Lord knows, he knows how the flesh works. He knew what the king of Ai was going to do. He knew it. He knew he was filled with the pride of life. When you know how the enemy works, you can set a trap for victory. And so as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the uh, Areba to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. Stop right there. Hold your finger right there. Verse 15 is next. What is this a picture of? This is beautiful. Satan does not have the mind of Christ. Amen. What do you mean? He is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. He is not omnipresent. Satan can only be in one place at one time. He does not know the future, and he doesn't know what your mind's saying. He doesn't. He's limited in his ability. That's how we can defeat him. Because he's limited. But our, our God... Jesus, he knows my thoughts. He knows my heart better than I. That's why when I yield to him and completely surrender him, I can then live in his victory. Why? Because instead of wrestling in the flesh, now I've given it over to Christ. See, the king of this, of the flesh, he doesn't know what tomorrow holds. He just is operating on what? See, Satan really thinks he can whoop Jesus. He's stupid. He's really dumb. He doesn't know anything. He's still trying to beat Jesus up. Man, he doesn't know much. Verse 15. So Joshua and all of Israel, you know, some people just don't know when they're defeated. And Joshua and all of Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. Oh, that's a big mistake. And they left the city open and pursued Israel. 
Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that's in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in the hand, his hand toward the city, and then the men in ambush, remember the 30,000? Oh, they rose quickly out of their place, and as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, oh no, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that, for the people who fled to the wilderness now turned back against their pursuers. And when Joshua and all the cities saw that the ambush had captured the city, and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the others, the, the ones in ambush that were in the city, they came out from the city against them. So that they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side, some on, they were surrounded. And Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai, he took alive and brought him near to Joshua. And when Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword, all of Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as their plunder, according to the word of the Lord that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai, made it forever a heap of ruins, as it is to this day, and he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset Joshua commanded, they took his body down from the tree, and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day." Here we see the picture of how we are going to defeat the flesh. We conquer the flesh by yielding. The fact that Israel ran from before their enemies was an actual vivid picture of Christ yielding to the Father's plan. It does not make sense, rational sense, for the King of kings and Lord of lords to leave his throne come to this earth and die on the cross for others. It doesn't make sense. It, it, people, that are un, it, people that don't know Christ, they look at that and say, that's nonsense. But to those who re, are redeemed by it, they look at it, and it is, it is our love story. Amen. And so what happened on the day of Christ's death? I'll tell you what happened. On that Friday, there was the biggest party ever in hell. Yeah. And the prince and power of this air and the, his, his, his supernatural forces, they threw a big party. They were doing the devil dance. I don't even know what that is. But they were doing it. Because why? They thought they had won. You say, no, they didn't. Yes, they did. Stop giving Satan the mind of Christ. He doesn't know right from wrong. He is deceived. He is the creature that thought he could be like the creator. And so when he gave in to that thought, he became deceived forevermore. He's deceived. He thinks he's greater than God. That sets him up for defeat. And so when Jesus yielded to the Father's plan and gave his life as a sacrifice, Satan played right into the plan and what? Went after it. And nailed him to the cross. Because if Satan knew what was going to come, he'd have never killed him. Think about that for a second. By killing Jesus, he provided the victory for all that believe in him. And Father, remember when Peter, remember when Jesus was in the Gospels, when he was in Israel, ministering for three years and at one point, he told his disciples, hey, this is what's going to happen. Wicked men are going to take me. They're going to make me suffer. And they're going to kill me. And on three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And Peter said, oh, no, not on my watch. I'm not going to let that happen to you, Jesus. And he's, what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. See, that, that mindset of Peter is the mindset of the typical Christian after we mess up. I'm going to try harder. I'm not going to let this happen again. That's from the flesh. I don't have any ability to change me on the inside. I have no ability 
to change my feelings about Jesus. I got no ability. But God does. Only he can change my mind on that. Only he can change my emotion. Only he can change me on the inside out. All the flesh can do is try to work from the outside in. But sin comes from the inside. It doesn't come from the outside. We're not defiled on the outside. We're defiled from our heart on the inside. So this is a picture of Christ. You look at Christ's words in the gospel, Luke 23. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands. I'm going to do my job now. I'm going to do it. No, he said, I commit. I yield my spirit. It was a yielding. And having said this, he breathed his last breath. That's how Jesus won the victory for us. By yielding to the Father's plan. How do we win the victory? By yielding our lives. You can't come to Christ in salvation by saying, yeah, I'm going to take that. No, no, you have to yield to it. You have to surrender. Say, I'm going to stop fighting. What does the Bible say? How to have spiritual victory? If we confess our sin, if we yield to it and admit it, then God is faithful and just to do the work of cleansing it. And what? Putting his righteousness into our life. That's a work of God. I have to just submit to it. And so the picture of them running away is a picture of Christ yielding. And then them turning and fighting at the appointed time is the picture of the third day resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see in resurrection Christ rallied and gave the powers of darkness defeat. I mean, can you imagine Sunday morning when Jesus stepped out of that tomb and the demons went... Oh, Satan, sorry to report something. What, what, man? We're partying. Um, he's alive. Hallelujah. Oh, no. Who's alive? Well, the one we nailed, you know, the one, the one. I'm not going to say his name, but you know, that guy that we crucified, he's alive. Amen. What do you mean he's alive? I thought we were done with him. Oh, no. He rose in victory. Over sin, death, hell, and Satan to show he had nothing on him. He stepped out of that tomb and said, now you're in trouble. Now you're in trouble. Now, in resurrection, that's the picture of them turning and addressing their enemies now. And he said to them in Luke 24, after his resurrection, he tells these same guys who were before didn't want him to die. Now after his resurrection, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law, of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city till you've clothed with power from on high. Those that have not surrendered are going to suffer the fate. Remember, Joshua is a picture of Jesus. His name is Yeshua, Jesus. Jesus one day is going to, with his death, burial, and resurrection, he is going to judge all flesh. And... All flesh will be destroyed with the exception of those who in the flesh have surrendered to his control. Everybody else, not one will escape his judgment. He will judge all flesh. All flesh. Every neighbor you have, every family member, every co-worker, every one of your relatives... Everybody you know on Facebook, because I know you don't know all those people that are on your Facebook, but all 493 friends, God's going to judge all flesh. And only those who have surrendered to him are safe on that day. Only those surrendered. Now, let me, let me give you a personal example of this. It happened with my daughter. It it's, it's so fits this. I'm so proud of my girls. I, I talk to you about them, but, uh, you know, they're a long ways from home. It's hard to be away from home. Those of you that go to school at home, you got a tough job, too, because I don't know why it is. When you go to school at home, parents expect you to work. 
And man, that's hard. It's hard to go to work 20, 30 hours and then go to school full time. And it's just, it, it, you know, my hat's off to you, college people, those of you that are, that are doing the job. And I'm, I'm proud of my girls, you know. They're, they've handled being away from home, and, and it was iffy at times, let me tell you. And uh, it's been hard on us, too. Uh, but this year, they actually lived together, and it's been a, been a fit, benefit to them. And I'm especially proud of Rachel, our baby. Chrissy, the oldest, she's, you know, she's type A. She's a little bit driven, you know. And Rachel's kind of like, you know, the relaxed one of the two. And uh, she has become so disciplined in her time, her eating, uh, in her relationship with her fiancé. I, I just, where sometimes we're like, wow, some of it's stuck. It's kind of surprising, you know, and, and, and so we're, we're, you know, there at times we're like, yay, and then other times it's like, oh, it's still in there. And so we had a it's still in there moment recently. You know, Christmas time, my in-laws live in Los Angeles, and, and uh, I think Pop's going to be 90 this year, I think, in August, and, and his wife's going to be 80, 85. They're eld- quite elderly, and his Christmas presents are in a, in a little envelope. He sends a check. And, uh, you know, old school Christmas present. My daughters love the Christmas presents, right? And uh, so he got the story mixed up. He, he heard that Rachel was going to go see Sean's family during Christmas, but he thought she was going to go the whole time. So he sent her Christmas present to her apartment in Lynchburg. But it was last year's address. Okay? So you don't know my my father-in-law, but I call him Pop. He's a World War II veteran, lived a Marine, and made it through Guadalcanal. He's one of the few, you know, one out of ten guys that survived Guadalcanal. Um, he's a, a retired twice from Los Angeles Police Department, uh, and then he became a personal bodyguard to uh, one of the executives at Oxy Petroleum, and during, you know, during OPEC and all that nonsense, and and, uh, and then retired from that. I mean, he's, he's this, you know, dot your I's, cross your T's type guy. And so, you know, he's wanting to know if Rachel got her check. And, and so, he's like, no, he, oh, I sent it to the apartment. Oh, you were mistaken. Well, she'll get it when she gets back. And then we find out, you know, we get back and it's not there. And we find out he sent it to last year's address. And so he's a little, you know, it hasn't. Um, you know, gone through the bank, and so he's like, oh, it's, it didn't just disappear, it's out there, it's probably, so he said, it's probably, you know, it's really bothering Pop, it's probably at the post office, undelivered mail, and she actually, uh, her last year's roommates are still in that apartment, and they didn't get it, and no, no, we didn't get, nothing came for you, Rach, and then come to find out, he missed one of the numbers on the address, oh no, and so, he was like, oh, I have her go to the post office. Now, he lives in Los Angeles at 20 million people. He's thinking Lynchburg, Virginia is kind of like Petticoat Junction. Okay? And, and my daughter's going to come walking in the post office, and they're going to say, we've been waiting for you. Here's your letter from Grandpa. We looked at the light. Man, you're going to be happy. You know? And, that, it's, it's, and, and so he's like, you know, southern town. And, and it's, and it's, but, but he's got the right. He's like, you know, before I cancel the check and all that, just... Just have her go. I'm like, Rachel, go to the post office. You know, your, your pop, it's bothering pop. It's bothering grandpa. Go to the post office and just see. So she's like, okay, okay. And you know, her, her third year of nursing, it's just insane, the pressure. In, in your third, you know, she, these classes, she's taking medical, surgical, and pharmacology and all this. It's like, it makes my brain hurt when she talks about it. And, and she's handling it. And so... She goes to the post office finally one day. And she gets some time in her schedule, goes to the post office, leaves the post office, calls her mother, weeping <gasps> on the phone. She's like, what, what? I mean, like, you know, somebody just died weeping. <gasps> I just hate it when people make me feel like I'm not smart. <laughs> She's just weeping on the phone. And her mother's like, what happened? What happened? You know, the mother thing. It's like, what happened? Well, I went to the post office and I told him the story and everything. And then he said, what's my address? 
And I explained to him, well, I've moved three times. I don't remember my address from last year. And he looked at her like, you think we can just come up with this mail with your name? And she was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm Rachel. Isn't that enough? She had an AI moment. She's taking care of all these details. And all of a sudden, mama goes from sympathizing to like, Rachel, Rachel. you didn't know your address? How do you expect them to find the man? Oh, you're doing what he did. Right? She had this moment, this fleshly moment where it's like, you mean I needed my address to get the mail? Yeah, you actually did. Now, you say, well, what happened? Well, she's recovered, and now we're laughing about it. And I also told her on Skype the other day, oh, Rachel, it was her birthday this week. I said, Rachel, it is such a good sermon example. I can't wait to use that. In fact, I'm going to weave it in as soon as I can. But don't we have those AI post office moments? We're taking care of our marriage. We're looking after our kids. We're responsible for this. And then all of a sudden, boom, I needed an address. Isn't that how sin tricks us? And we look so... And then when it happens, we're like, oh, it's not fair. The system's against me. And they're like, God failed us when we realize we weren't being responsible and yielding to him. Yeah. That's what it's really about. If she would have put any kind of effort into finding that lost mail, because she knows, bottom line, grandpa's going to send her another one. So she didn't go to that post office with the intensity that she goes to class. She didn't go to that post office with the intensity she deals with her relationship or with her health or her eating. No, no, she was like, yeah, I'm just going to add it on to what I'm doing. You know, get, it off, get it off my plate. Boy, that's when we trip up, isn't it? When we start floating. When we don't understand that every day Satan walks around our life like a roaring lion looking where he can take a chunk out of us. You should be on guard. Oh, but we don't. And so what happens is we stop surrendering and we start fighting the battle ourselves. Oh, well, I'll take the address in next time. Yeah. And then we have a chip on our shoulder. And then we make room for bitterness. And then all of a sudden we add more and more layers of what? What I can do to make sure that doesn't happen again. And God's not even part of the equation again. Now he's not even in the circumstance. It's just us fighting the enemy. Oh, that's a bad spot to be in. Because remember, the victory comes from inside out. Inside out. So God, these guys surrender to God's plan. God gives them a wonderful victory. What is the right response to that? The right response is gratitude, is it not? I mean, for being Christians, we should be forever, in, in, I mean, just thankful to God. In verse 30, 35, they respond properly. It says, at the time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones, upon which no man has welded an iron tool. And so they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. It cost them something. Their gratitude cost them something. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, you know, the Big Ten, the commandments, which he had written. And all of Israel, sojourner as well. Who's the foreigner? Who's the sojourner? How about Rahab and her family? How about all the people that left Egypt with them? You know, who, you know what there was room for right there? All the inhabitants of Jericho and Ai and Bethel. There was room for them in Christ too. But what did they decide? No, no, no. We're going to fight what he's doing. We're not going to surrender. And they got judged. There's room. There was room for the one. Rahab, there's room for her. 
There's room for the people of Egypt that painted the blood on the doorpost. There's room for anybody that surrenders. Oh, but if you're going to fight it in your flesh, you're headed for judgment. And so the sojourn, as well as the native born, with their elders and officers and their judges, they stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim. These two mounts are real close. And half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived in Mount. What did he read? Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's what he read. He read the words of the law. How they were going to be a society. Why? Because they're in the promised land. This is going to be their home now. He says, this is how we're going to conduct ourselves. This is how we're going to live blessed lives. This is how God's going to curse us if we disobey him. And they read all the words of the law after they did what? After they worshipped him. Now, this, the reason it talks about the two mounds is that they created a natural a- amphitheater to hear God's blessings and cursings pronounced. And what did they say? As they gathered together, the first thing they did was build an altar and worship the Lord with sacrificial gifts. Amen. Why? Because they knew their victory was due to a covenant relationship with Jehovah God. Amen. What do you mean a covenant relationship? It means this. The people standing there that day in victory were no better than the dead carcasses on the battlefield of Ai. They were no better than the dead people under the ruins of Jericho. There was no difference. The difference was the promise of God in their life that they had submitted to. God made the difference, not the people. The people in church today... We are just like the people that said, I don't have time for God today. We're just like them. The difference is God's promise to us because we've yielded him in belief. Now listen, when we take the Lord's Supper, here's what we do. The Lord told us how to do it. He said, take the bread as a symbol of my body which is broken and then take the cup. And he says, as you drink this cup, realize it is the blood of a new covenant between me and you. Now, what is that new covenant? If we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That is the promise of the cup. And that's the only thing that makes us different. It's the covenant relationship we have with Jesus Christ. So why would we try to fight the Cheez-Its Without Jesus. I can't beat the cheese that's in the flesh. I can't. But if I surrender to God, he can give me the victory over the cheese that's. He can. Because I'm just like my daughter. I have those moments where I'm like, oh, didn't see that one coming. Like, how could you not see that coming? Because I'm not God. But he sees it coming. All of it. And he will give me the victory as I yield to him. And so they stand there as a nation with the foreigners and they weave God in the daily life circumstance. They said, this is what our life is about. And they weave God right in the midst of it. Now think of, if you will, to the great writer of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. The greatest preacher of all time outside of Christ. And here's what the preacher said. In Romans 7, he said, man, the things that I want to do that I know is right, I never can find the the ability to do it. But the things I know I shouldn't be doing, oh, I always got time for those. And then he summarized it by saying this, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Not what, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So Paul reached a point in his life where he's like, this flesh has nothing good for me. It's a wretched body. It holds no promise for me. The only promise I have is that one day I'm going to be delivered from it. 
And in the next verse, he gives the answer. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. They're submitting to him in that relationship. And when Paul, who wrote earlier in that same book, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it alone, it alone, is the power, the dynamite of God unto all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. What did he say there? The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the only thing powerful enough to change me from the inside out. Nothing else can. I can't decide to be, okay, I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to be a better devoted husband. I'm going to be a a more faithful father. That's all well and good, but it doesn't change me on the inside. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change me on the inside. Only that. It is the power of God unto all who believe. Let me ask you something. Have you exchanged the power of God in a relationship with a real Jesus for religion? It's a good question. Because that's what they did right between Jericho and Ai. They exchanged the power of God for religion. We can do this. God's on our side. We can do this. So that's, it's, that's religion. As soon as you start saying, we can. It's relationship. When you say, I can't. He can. Only he can through me. Through me. So may we at Gilead live in total reliance upon God's power. It's the only... It's the only path to victory. It's all of, the victory is not against AI. It's not against Jericho. The victory is against who and what we are going to rely upon and depend upon. The Apostle Paul, in closing, wrote this in Galatians 2.20. Just like when I walked by the Cheez-Its aisle last night. I have walked by the Cheez-Its aisle with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ. I died to it. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't let it have an impact. I died to it. I walked by it. It is no longer I who live, but Christ now lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is the only power available to us by which we can defeat the flesh. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to believe it anew each and every day because why the gospel is a gospel of second chances each day his mercies are new each day let's stand to our feet this morning everything is said